Okay, let's get started now. Um, there's still some people trickling in, but I'm going to give a, a quick introduction um, about Focal Plane and the company of biologists and a few of the things that we're doing at the moment. So at uh, the company of biologists yesterday was an exciting day because it was our 99th birthday, which means that next year the company is going to turn 100. And so we would like to invite you all to come and celebrate our 100th birthday with us. So we're hosting um, a conference called Biologists at 100. It's taking place in Liverpool next March. Um, the registration's open. Um, I'll be posting the links to this in the chat. So hopefully you can uh, go ahead and have a look. Um, plenty of microscopy work going on there. And I guess this audience here might be particularly interested in a couple of the um, keynote speakers uh, talking about emerging technologies uh, where we have Manu Prakash and Jennifer lippincott Sports, but also yeah, a fantastic uh, program. So I really encourage you to go check that out. Um, for this meeting, um, Vocal Plane and our sister community site, The Node, we're looking for conference reporters. So if you're intending to uh, research or intending to come to the meeting and want to get a bit more of experience of science communication, then please um, look and again, I'll post the links uh, into becoming our conference reporter. Um, we'll be happy to assist you um, on this and uh, we'll uh, waive your registration fee. So yeah, please have a look at that. And the application deadline for that is the 29th of November. Okay, so then moving on to some more focal plane stuff, I just wanted to tell you quickly about a few of the new things that we have. Um, so we're now hosting a micro list on focal plane. So this is a fantastic collection of resources that was put together by Jennifer Waters and her team um, at Harvard. So now this resource space is available on focal plane. And so please come have a look, add your resources um, and yeah, just generally check that one out. Uh, we also, for all you cell biologists out there, we're now developing a cell biology corner on focal plane. Um, and at the moment, this consists of actually having um, designated cell biology jobs and events boards, which will run alongside our microscopy jobs and events boards in collaboration with Microscopy DB. And then just in terms of funding, we have a couple of, well, we have a funding opportunity for you to, to have a look at. So we now offer microscopy training grants. This is alongside uh, Journal of Cell Science. Um, applications for this are kind of always open. Um, and then we just have these application deadlines, which means that we're gonna consider the applications after that. So if there's a training course in microscopy or bioimage analysis um, that you want to attend, then please check this out. This might be the, uh, the grant for you. Um, and just in terms of grants, we just wanted to mention, just wanted to mention this imaging for all scheme. Um, so this is being uh, coordinated by Global Bioimaging. And it's, um, it's a fantastic, fantastic scheme. And they have these three different tracks um, to enable you to fund uh, your access and training um, in microscopy. And it's open to people, researchers uh, in lower middle income countries. Um, so again, check out all of these tracks. You might find the perfect funding opportunity for you. Um, and then finally, just a quick advert for the next webinar in our series. So this is going to be a celebration of the Journal of Cell Science special issue on imaging cell architecture and dynamics. Um, yeah, we're really looking forward to hearing these talks and the registration for this webinar is just open. So again, please check that out and I'll be dropping all of the links um, in the chat for you, to, for you to have a look at. Um, and so that's everything for me, which just leaves me to hand over to Helena, who's gonna tell us how not to lie with image data. Okay, I'm replacing the current sh sharing with my, and now you should see my screen. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm going to um, just quickly introduce myself. I'm uh, still a member of the TU Dresden, as announced, but I am actually now an associate professor in, in Kuh in Switzerland, where I teach data visualization. So my um, my expertise really is more in the um, data, data, data visualization, and one part of that is image data in life science and med medicine, but uh, it's only a small part of what, what I do. So the real expert is the next speaker, Kota, from whom I learned everything I know about image analysis, which I apologize, Kota, is not so much anymore, but you did a good job. You tried your best. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay, before I start and kind of to set the frame, I wanted to um, to step back once for one minute and say that why we visualize. So in biology, we use visualizations and also images are a visualization of electronic data. That much I remember from Kota. Um, <laughs> and uh, we use visualizations for three different purposes in our uh, scientific uh, life. And the first one is that we use them for exploring. So one part of the images that we use is to explore ourselves, patterns of uh, in the cells or shapes, changes, etc. So we look at these images ourselves in order to understand biology. The next time that we use these images is actually for presentation. So when we summarize basically our findings in a scientific manuscript or a paper or on a poster or on a talk, we actually have to select uh, which image we use and we have to make sure that it's really broadly understandable because not everyone remembers, for example, what uh, what um, uh, channels we used for, for imaging. So we have to explain already a lot more to our audiences. And then the last scenario when we use images is for you know advertisement or data communication when we speak to the public, when we speak to um, I don't know in my case to patients or when we speak to policymakers, and these are the images that probably don't need to be that explanatory anymore, but they need to be, still be shiny and in in theory they should uh, should still be real uh, microscopy images in other words they should not be misleading so there are different cases when we use images and depending on which where we are at we have to apply rules uh, to image and image processing more stricter or less strict so briefly why we why do we visualize in the first place here's a super brief exercise you're going to see something on the screen for 0 0.3 seconds and you're going to have to look at it now and i'm going to count down from three and then you have a very brief image what do you remember? Three, two, one, gone. So that was extremely short and it flashed on your screen. But I know that in these 0 0.3 seconds, which is the shortest time I can do this on, 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 on the PowerPoint, you already saw a lot of information. Mainly you recognize what was a display type. In this case, these were uh, letters of the alphabet. It could have been an image, it could have been microscopy images, whatever it was, you will have recognized what it is. Uh, you also uh, were probably able to see which letters of the alphabet these were, so you were able to read some of the text. Uh, these were the letters uh, in, in their full glory, and probably you noticed that you uh, read one or two of them, K, Z, R, usually the B also. Very rarely people pay attention to what's at the bottom. So when we see visualizations, we read them as if they are text. We start at the top left corner and we kind of go by line by line through to the end. So this is a general principle of visual perception of how we interact with visualizations and that's also how we interact with image visualizations that we see out in the wild. Then we also probably notice the layout where uh, that these uh, letters were organized in a grid of three by three uh, and you also paid attention to the colors usually involuntarily so they're usually just something that you um, you don't uh, realize you're seeing, but these were well, white letters on a blue background. So there are these four levels of information that we are always consuming every single time that we look at anything. And these are also the four levels that we have to take care of when we, uh, when we prepare images for our presentations. And the big problem is that visualizations can and do often fail. And there are numerous different reasons why they do that. One is that they can be misleading. For example, we can have misleading charts that map the data not to the correct variable, but we can also have misleading images data where um, people spliced and copied uh, parts of an image. And probably you are all familiar with the work from Elizabeth Big uh, at Microbiome Digest, who's really, really spending a lot of time investigating the prevalence and the occurrence of what goes wrong in images and Western blood images and also in microscopy images. Um, so these are just for you in the slides, the links, if you want to find more about this intentional misleading that Elizabeth Big is uh, very interested in. But then there's also, of course, um, misleading images uh, that just happen because um, uh, they are accidental they're in a in way that someone was misusing po po tools in the image analysis process. And I think that's what Quota will spend a little bit more time on. Uh, no, he doesn't look like it. 
<laughs> well, we'll we have a surprise. Could I could I may be able to answer questions afterwards about how to do image analysis properly to not accidentally be misleading. You, you wrote a paper about this, at least. People can check that. <laughs> um, then uh, what I'm mostly interested in is not the sad cases when people are actually producing misleading images, but um, the issues when people produce confusing images. And confusing images in uh, org charts can happen when there's just simply too much information and it's like at first glance a chaotic situation. And that can happen uh, in charts, but it can also happen in images, for example, here, when a color scale is chosen where the bottom and the top has the same uh, appearance of red. Probably it's com for a computational uh, readout, it still works, but not for our eye, which cannot dif differentiate these two color shades anymore. So these are the cases that are, that are totally avoidable with a little bit of learning. And uh, be, when when be, when I started to get into interested in confusing images in publication, I, um, together with Tracy Weisgerber, I did a survey on what is the prevalence of confusing images in, in figures, and you can read all about this in the um, in the paper. And um, uh, Helen will paste the link to a website where I have collected all the links and resources also for you to just uh, have them in one place. So what we then, for example, did in the in this work was that we quantified just how many images are confusing in current publications. And we addressed a lot of different aspects. One of them, for example, uh, is scale information available, yes or no. Um, so the common problems with uh, scale information in, in papers are that either there's no scale bar whatsoever, so we just have images with zero indication of the scale information. There are also scale bars that are illegible because they have a poor compression. So this can happen when you uh, burn it into the image too early in the in the process, and then you cannot um, then you have a compression artifact, for example, and it's not no longer legible in the final figure in the paper. Um, there's also a problem that scale bars can blend into the background, so they actually are there, but you don't really see them because the color is not in high contrast, or the scale bars are in, contra in colors that are poorly visible or have uh, similar features as parts of the images. So these are the, the, pro the, pro the problems that we defined beforehand be before doing the screening. And then uh, what we found uh, was that we looked at uh, the top 10 impact factor journals, um, not because we believe in the impact factor, but simply because we assumed that in those journals, there was a fairly rigorous uh, peer review process that should have eradicated a lot of the mistakes. And what we found, we focused on physiology and cell biology and plant science, just to have three exemplary cases. And uh, our study revealed that there was no scale bar information in 24% of the papers in physiology, 10% in cell biology, and 29% in plant science. And this was really zero scale information, nothing, no indication whatsoever uh, what, what the scale is. Um, there was partial scale information. So for example, some of the images contained and some didn't. So probably someone just forgot them or something. So we were you know, generous in our uh, judging it. And these are the numbers. So what you can see in sum is that the uh, the problem is not insignificant if you think that uh, one million papers are published every single year in the life sciences. So around um, half around half of them seem to be having problems with some or all of scaled information. Um, yeah, this is just for completeness. Um, that's of course not great. And we didn't only look at image scale, but we also took into account um, color legends, did the, where the colors explained, where the insets explained, where the magnifications explained, and where the colors legible, etc. And so, in sum, uh, we found out all, uh, taking taking together all of these features, we found that only ten to twenty percent of the publications in high impact journals are really fully understandable. So uh, most of them had one or the other problem. So that's of course not great. <laughs> um, this is uh, this is too little, uh, which indicated to us that really there is a lot of education necessary on how to uh, handle images and prepare them for publication. 
and to uh, to help along the way of, of education in, in this dire direction, we generated, first of all, a slide deck that you can use for teaching. So, for example, if you are a teacher and you would like to discuss examples with your with your classes, undergraduate or graduate classes, and you can use these slides and just see lots and lots of examples of what can go wrong and how to improve it uh, so you can like use them. And then together with Christopher Schmid, um, who I think also already gave a, a, se a seminar here at Focal Plan, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we did, we generated also cheat sheets. So these are targeted really at novice users. So someone who's starting out as a master student or PhD student in lab for the first time is touching a microscope and he can use these cheat sheets to kind of, or she can use these cheat sheets to kind of navigate along the path on how to get from a microscopy image all the way to a publication. And uh, we also explain how to do this with Fiji, which is an open source uh, microscopy uh, suit. Together with Kota, in fact, <laughs> I was for many two years also debating how what do we define as the best uh, images. So what do we define as a minimum consensus that an Im image in, as a publication must fulfill? And the result of this two-year discussion um, of not just Kota and me, but also uh, 53 other authors um, is summarized in the recent Nature Method paper, where we basically um, defined the minimal uh, requirements uh, for uh, before an image can be published. And um, these were not meant to put more pressure on, on all authors, which is already very high, but rather to give authors a quick guideline to double check before they submit a paper and before they prepare figures to make sure that they are uh, uh, preparing images that are actually fully understandable to their audiences. And uh, now very briefly, I want to go through my personal top 10 tips on how not to lie. And uh, this should be just very quick. You can read up all the more details in the relevant papers that I just mentioned or in the slides later on. So first one, when you start with a, with an image, you make a copy in order to keep an uh, original image untouched. So on that copy, you can then uh, start working and start um, the first steps that you need in order to prepare a figure. For example, you may need to tilt an image or you may need to make some adjustments. And um, if you save the original microscope image, you can always restart the whole process in case you did something wrong along the way. The second uh, decision you have to take is um, what is the magnification on the final page of that you want to be communicating because very often we take the whole view with I don't know 50 cells and only one of them may, might be relevant for our actual communication so the decision on what to crop from that large field of view is of course the first step that you need to do when creating a figure because nothing is more annoying than seeing a figure that has tiny 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 dots of cells and then you using a lot of work and arrow etc to point out one of the tiny cells instead you want to be able to for people to focus on the relevant detail and sometimes you want to maybe show that what you cropped out of an image is not just your personal favorite selection, but actually truthful. So you might actually want to show um, the both uh, the, the 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 full view and uh, an inset along alongside each other. So these are the kind of decisions that you have to make uh, before preparing a uh, figure with an image. Um, then the next uh, thing is that you have to dis decide whether or not you co show colors in your images. Obviously, uh, every microscopy image usually is black and white, grayscale. Uh, so, um, and grayscale is actually the highest contrast you can have. So we can see 50,000 shades of gray, but we cannot see that many in blue, red, or, or magenta. So if you're aiming for a, a very high contrast of, or ha much detail in your images, then a blue uh, color on black is very, very poor, and a, a black color on white or a white color on black background has much better contrast. So you will simply be able to communicate a lot better what you want to be showing. And then you can always test the visibility uh, by just turning that image into grayscale. And you can already see that the blue one has very, very poor details uh, available. The second uh, decision that you then need to make about colors is if you have two channels, how do you show these two channels? Uh, do you mix them or not? 
So if you mix them in one uh, one one image, if you overlay these two channels, you have to be colorblind safe. And you can see here an, a, an example. So with a normal vision, you would be able to see that there are red dots in, in an otherwise green cell with some dots, green dots. To a person with deuteranopia, this is of course all yellow. So that means if we mix these two colors uh, already in a in an image figure, um, someone with deuteranopia will not be able to see any of the details. If we, however, choose a color combination that is also visible to deuteranopia, for example, by switching red to magenta. Uh, we now ensure that at least the color differentiation is possible. It's not ideal, but it's possible. And you will see um, if you look, if you flip through lots of microscopy Im or microscopy image from the last 20 years, that probably 20 years ago, red and green was absolutely standard. So you showed GFP uh, in green and you showed RFP in red. No changes, despite all of them coming out as grayscale. Uh, nowadays, I'm, I'm really, really happy to, uh, to say that I see a lot of people that are already colorblind safe image producing double images with colorblind safe mode. So we can see a lot of the magenta plus green. Um, so the um, uh, people are learning, which is good. So teaching something like this is actually uh, fruitful. <laughs> um, the next thing is we have you have three color images. That's the fun part because now you're no longer able to find any color combination that is actually a colorblind safe fully. Uh, so that means you have to split actually the channels into their individual components. So if you have a red, a green, and a blue one, you have to split them either in the red, green, blue, or show them in grayscale or invert them. So you have to find a way of ensuring that everyone can see three colors merged in one. And um, yeah, in general, that's not possible. And I'm fully aware that we are going into uh, territories beyond three three color images very often. And, we, um, and uh, yeah, the bad news is that it's not visible to most people. And the good news is that you can nowadays usually uh, have a lot more space for your figures in, in electronic age of publishing. So you're no longer super restricted in the size of your images, uh, which means you can uh, have it linked to repositories, etc. So you can gain space to publish really everything in an accessible manner. The next thing is if you use color, you need to explain them. So every single color that you use ever in an, in an image must be explained. And um, you can do this, for example, by writing out the color in the in the respective um, the, the text color, the uh, color the text in the same way as the image part. Um, but um, in general, you again have to be colorblind safe. So if you combine somehow red and green, uh, you should not replicate that in the annotations. Number seven, well, I've already discussed this very briefly. Every single image needs some scale information. Uh, I've already indicated beforehand how uh, how often that is missing. And just to bring home a tiny bit of uh, uh, information from history, this is not new, right? So there were already scientific images in the atlases of antiquity. And back then, they didn't actually have scale bars that were included as we do today, but they usually, at the beginning of an atlas, indicated at which scale the images were shown. For example, all images are shown according to life size, or something like this. So there were ways back then how they communicated the size of, of, of specimen shown in uh, 2000 years ago already. So we have a long, long history, and we shouldn't stop it uh, now in the electronic age. And then, of course, you can also have a little bit of fun <laughs> just for, <laughs> for you. Uh, there's a very curious paper, Zoppe et al., uh, that indicated, hey, let's get rid of boring scale bars and replace them with cats. I'm not sure how, how whether that's a really, really good, uh, good approach, but basically their idea was that you indicate for a whole protein complex, the size uh, you compare it to the size of the cat, and then you can show the cat that when you zoom into a, pro a part of the protein complex, you also zoom into the image of the cat. It's debatable whether that's useful at all, but just to uh, broaden your spectrum on or broaden your view on what a scale bar, bar could look like. And here is one from Philip Court, a port that uses goggly eyes instead of um, scale bar. So, you know, you can have a little bit of fun. Let's let's put it that way, probably in presentations more than in publications. 
Um, La, uh, next, you might want to also annotate other things than color and size. You might under, want to annotate regions of interest or structures, etc. So then you also have to you you are able, of course, to include this. But if you do, if you, for example, include a region of interest, a B or a, a star, you have to again explain them and indicate what they mean somewhere in the legends or below the picture. And then lastly, then that's now uh, for arranging several images into a panel. Um, you need to, able to you need to find a way of nicely arranging the layout and 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 putting the images next to each other. And um, the what I recently have learned is that there's a tool on how you can do this with image J. And I for, forgot to put them in the website, but I will add these two. So Jérôme Moutara. Uh, published a tool that allows you to uh, to play nicely place all the images that you want to publish into a big panel figure of many many of them next to each other in a gridded system that is really nice to see. And then, of course, once you're done with it, you need to have a figure legend. No image ever is self-explanatory, so you need to spend some more time on on giving more details. And here's a nice blog about this by uh, Brock Morsel. Um, on, on how to do this best. So these were the uh, 10 tips from me and a couple of resources and uh, the website link you should have received by now with all the links that were, I showed along the way and I will add the last two. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Helena, that was uh, fantastic. So yeah, if anyone has any questions, then please um, type them into the uh, question and answer box. Um, we have one comment, which is uh, best annotation scale ever. And I think they're talking about the, the cats they, they've written, I think, uh, yeah. All the googly eyes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I guess, even on that though, the important thing is, yeah, to define what the cat or the googly eyes mean. You still need to have that information um, there as well. Um, and yeah, yeah as Helen is- cat yeah. information is a very good idea, but- it's just one idea. We we can we you know we can grow and keep doing trying out things. And um, so I, I had a quick question regarding the, the three color images. So you said about um, showing the channels separately. How, how do you think it's okay to also show a merge with the understanding that some people won't be able to access that, um, or is it better just to stick with the um, the uh, grayscale images or the individual images? I should say. Um, okay, so so personally, I think it always looks uh, unsymmetric, but this is purely my uh, my um, my ambition as a design the designer, information designer, that if you have one merge and then the split split one, it usually looks a little unsymmetric. Mm -hmm. But of course, you can do this. Yeah, I mean, if you say this is a merge and this is a split view version, um, then it's totally fine and accessible to everyone. And I mean, ideally. I mean, going forward, we're in an electronic publishing age. You could even have a, a, an interactive image where you could click and unclick uh, yeah. little channels, right? So that you could make every combination that you would possibly want yourself. Like things like that, I would love to see <laughs> happening uh, in publication in publications. But I'm still submitting them as Word files uh, if I have a paper and and PNG. So there's not so much um, progress on that front. And then last last comment on that is that we have um, uh, we have a lot a very very good ability. Our eyes can spot the exact same point in three images that are next to each other, right? So we are much better at finding the exact same spot in three images side by side than we think. So that usually works quite well. Okay, and yeah, I guess related to your comment about being able to flick between the different colors, someone's asked um, about if, if there's a website um, to see which color schemes are colorblind safe. And Kota's mentioned a Fiji um, plugin that you can use, but I think there's other tools that yeah. are out there as well. Yeah, so in the resources, um, I have, um, in the resources, there's a link to WebAIM, which which really deals with all aspects of accessibility, right? Not just color blindness, but also other kinds of color vision inaccessibilities, contrast, etc. So that's uh, if you really want to dig down to the bottom, that's where you want to be going, probably. Um, then in the in the slide deck that I mentioned in the OSF accompanying the PLOS biology paper from me and Tracy. 
and a couple of others. <laughs> um, we also have this a lot of examples. Um, but uh, there used to be a nice website. In, in Japan, actually, Kota, <laughs> but not by Kota, by someone else, but it's defunct. So I've been handing this out for years and now it doesn't work anymore. So I cannot, rec I need to find a new one again. Which? Yeah, I'll send you a link. It's defunct. Okay. But okay. Uh, maybe one comment, uh, you can always, in most computers, you can change your display to look as if it's visible to a colorblind person. So I have an Apple machine, so I can go into the settings and I can go to the display and I can choose color scheme and then I can pick grayscale or deuteranopia and then it will render my whole screen uh, as if visible by those kind of impairments and then you can see it. Okay, and there's another couple of questions and a comment someone's commented, I guess everyone can see this about there's another tool about pairing figures to they're talking about a mirror figure, which actually we talked about in our previous uh, webinar on data management. Um, oh, no. But maybe this is a quick one and then uh, maybe a slightly longer one. So it says, what's your opinion on other color schemes? I think this is for two color images. So using um, orange and purple um, fresh rather than RGB or magenta green. Um, orange and purple. Uh, no, I don't have preference. So, so my prefer my my preference is a is a compromise. I know that there needs to be a semantic uh, agreement between the color I'm showing and the color it's visible at. So, if I have a GFP labeled anything, and I make it clear that I'm talking about a GFP, and every biologist know that GFP is green, then I okay. would make this an orange personally, yeah. <laughs> just to have a consistency between the naming and what is visible but yeah i mean and just pick one that is visible to both and that your supervisor and your co-authors are agreeing with because that's another compromise you have to usually <laughs> deal with and then yeah i don't i don't make strong recommendations maybe quota um <laughs> no also in colors <laughs> i tell you i don't have preference <laughs> So, uh, okay, but so then... I, I agree with this uh, semantic program uh, problem. Uh, so that, uh, if you flip GFP and RFP, and then uh, um, they actually look uh, different from what actually the meaning of green and red, then people get confused. So that, uh, exactly. better avoid this. Yeah. Uh, okay, so then we have a comment and a question, which is great talk. The checklists and cheat sheets are great. Um, but many PIs still prefer the RGB combination. Is there a good way to convince them? Uh, well, you know, you can tell them that 10% of the male population suffers from red and green colorblind because most people are in science are still yeah. male. You have a, a one in six at least chance that a, one of your reviewers, if, if not higher, uh, one is is one of one of them. So <laughs> if you piss off a reviewer, your paper will not get published. So that's my kind of tongue in cheek answer there, right? Just do the math and uh, calculate your risk. Perfect. Thank you very much. And thank you for all the, the questions and the comments um, from the audience as well. Um, we'll include those when I post the recording of the webinar as well, so you can refer back to them as well. And if any other questions for Helena pop up, then we'll keep a track of those as well and pass them on to her. Um, okay, so then I guess now it will pass over to Kota. And we'll hear um, a bit more about the image analysis um, side. Okay. All right. So try to place the face here. And, uh, so, um, so the title is a reproducible bioimage analysis for ensuring size integrity. But um, other way of saying is, how can we avoid wrong image analysis in life sciences? Um, so um, what is wrong uh, image analysis? So there are many cases, but then uh, I just want to take uh, one example. So uh, this is a thresholding issue, intensity measurement. The goal of analysis, let's say, automatic measurement of DNA contents. And what you do is with this uh, nucleus image, um, 
stand with something like Dapi, then uh, you want to threshold, then using if this is a Fiji or image A, then you do particle analysis, um, intensity measurements like this. So uh, each of them can be, you can have a list. So I, I think this is a kind of analysis that you see often, but um, this is wrong. No. I mean, uh, everyone gets shocked, not everyone, but the people who actually did this get shocked. So uh, there's a lot of um, discussion about this, but the, the reason that this is wrong is that the segmented area is affected by the intensity. How could we then measure the intensity? So that uh, um, the segmented area, you know, so that uh, this is based on some computation of a histogram of intensities, and then you select certain um, one intensity value that actually separates background and the signal. If there's a brighter um, nucleus, you get somehow a bit larger um, because you have a, a kind of a more larger region with brighter edge. So, um, because of this, uh, um, a lot of discussion happened with this. My, <laughs> um, I, I made this slide many years ago, and then afterwards there were many discussions, and then finally I made a figure that simulates the situation, so that uh, there's a darker spots spot, and then there's a another brighter spot, and this is a simulated image, so just a perfect circle blurred with Gaussian blurring, and then uh, the setting is like. Um, the intensity of brighter one is 67% higher with the mean intensity. Um, and then the area is identical. It's just that blurring is, um, has a kind of effect of this, uh, you know, making wider look. But if you auto threshold this, what happens is that um, with the segmentation, you measure and then what you get is that you only get 40% higher mean intensity because you actually select more regions I mean, the area, it's 40%, 41% more area would be detected with this uh, O2 threshold. So that um, then there's even more detailed discussion happened that whether this is, uh, how can we avoid this with the automatic threshold and so on. But um, in principle, you should not use single channel, both for segmentation and intensity measurement. And then uh, the, the best way is that you just try to do experiment with two channels, um, one marker, second marker, and then the first marker you use for segmentation and second marker for intensity measurements. I mean, uh, you should do this independently, right? So um, this is just one case, um, but um, um, there's many, many different type of uh, wrong image analysis that's happening. And then uh, how can we avoid this? So that, uh, one way is to um, um, press screening or to try to avoid this by um, guidelines. So that, um, just a list of what you can do and then what you cannot do. Um, so you restrict the data handling and analysis behavior. So you see this with uh, some of this very basic um, handling with journal guidelines, like uh, how you, what you should not do with contrast enhancements and so on. Um, but if you include such analytical uh, mistakes or wrong way of doing, uh, eventually we might have a very long list of uh, rules. And then, uh, so this is not really practical. And then um, what actually, um, what modern science has been doing is that free to do anything but report everything done with, um, in this case, it's image data, that others can reproduce the method and be ready for reviewing. So that uh, you can do anything but just write everything. So that um, in case of image analysis, somehow, environment analysis, it's too bad that some people even write just one sentence saying that images were analyzed using image J. So uh, we've been saying this 10 years, and then uh, these days you see uh, more descriptions. So you don't you, you see much less this one sentence image they used uh, type of uh, method description. And this is one example that I see with a longer description, but you know, I mean, I don't read everything. I, I don't read out everything, but let's say that um, there's a deconvolution of the software name, but we don't know so there's 
many different type of algorithms. And we don't know which deconvolution algorithm we use for this. And then there was also co-localization analysis performed with metamorph and image A. So you wonder which one, but in any case, in case of image A, there are many plugins and co-localization. And then it's not even mentioned where what it is. So that um, um of course, I mean there's a, another one, a cam graph. So was this the manually or somehow automatic? We don't know. So um, um you see a lot of it. This descriptions, but it's not really enough. So uh, um, there's a lot of such uncertainty in biomage analysis. So uh, just with the case of uh, um, threshold error, I mean, or detection of dots. So there could be algorithm A, B, C, and D, and then they could detect different type of uh, area, like this, like this, like this, like this. So that, uh, we will have to know which algorithm um, the researcher had to use, otherwise we cannot review it, right? And then uh, for this, we need a better description. And then uh, what we're saying now with this uh, checklist that we wrote with Helena and 52 other, because uh, in total it's 54, so minus two, right? Um, so with the 54 people we wrote, and then uh, so what we are recommending is to submit code so that um, any kind of code, what you imagine is that uh, computer code automates things so that, that makes your life easier. But um, another very important uh, role of computer code is that this is a description of what you did. So uh, taking that description part more um, emphasized so that uh, this is a very simple th procedure of counting nuclei here. So you open a file, auto threshold, and then uh, you do area opening to diminish small ones, and then uh, you analyze particles. So this is a Fiji, I mean, pr protocol. And then you can record this like this, um, mm -hmm. as you do with the graphic user interface. And then you can just push this create button, and then here's a macro right there. And then what you can do is that, you know, submit this code. The good thing about this is that they are all details, which algorithm was used for auto thresholding. So it's also, and then with the area opening, there's a precise value of which parameter value that you use for this area opening, 150. So uh, this is completely, you know, reproducible analysis, which any reviewer can reanalyze this and then say that, okay, so this is convincing if you have image data together. So uh, based on such concepts, um, um, especially with this uh, image analysis part in this community developed checklist, um, we made this uh, um, image analysis workflow checklist. So I'm trying to overview um, how actually each of these elements are. So this list is, um, there's a minimal requirements, recommended requirements, ideal requirements, and the minimal is a must, right? And then uh, I just go one by one. So key settings and example data code. So this can be like this a small piece of code that you recorded. And then you can just send it together with the uh, um, paper as a supplementary material. And another thing is very important is manual role. So that many research, so if you read papers, many people just use those uh, manual role. So hand-drawn roles. And then those roles can be saved. All right, so that in case of Fiji, you draw such a line and then get um, intensity profile. And mm -hmm. at the same time, you can save this in Roy Manager and then as a single file. So this is like this dot Roy file. So you can also submit this together so that uh, you know where actually you measured in uh, image data. Um, another several uh, more uh, elements that are required is that um, there should be a text in the method uh, or supplementary material describing the outline of your analysis and also precisely cite um, what tools you use, ImageA, MorphoLibJ, TrackMate, or Jacob, anything. I mean, those are, um, in majority of cases, they have some publication. And then uh, it's not because of nepotizing my friends, to uh, cite those papers, but um, you are 
doing some mathematical operations on those images so that uh, the outcome of our analysis is some kind of uh, this, all these mathematical operations, which needs to be um, described. And then instead of descri describing those operations, you cite those papers. So this is science, right? I mean, uh, but I see majority of people don't do this these days. I mean, still are. And then it's also that exact versions of these software is very important because different measurement results can happen depending on the version you used. And then image A, every time you open it, you see this version number here, right? So this is there because you, it's just offering you to write this in your paper if you use it, just, you know, image A 2.40.0 slash 1.54F, yeah? Together with the citation, it should be there. So those are the minimal um, requirements, but what's recommended is that um, those codes and example image data uh, to be published in GitHub or public repositories, for example, Zenodo. So that uh, um, this is really, you know, um, with some half a day training, you can just do this. Huh? So that, uh, for example, the, the calls that you for, even this is a full line of calls, you can just upload this in GitHub and then you can synchronize Zenodo and get the um, door stamping, right? And then, so you use this code as documentation, not for the use by other people. It's for the documentation purpose. It's just a, like a writing your paper. And then together with those goals, you can also publish image data and ROIs um, in data repositories such as Zenodo. And then uh, um, you don't have to, uh, you know, upload the complete set of original image data. I mean, Think about reviewer and then, uh, okay, so that, uh, if they have this uh, image data, they can reproduce and then study the details of your analysis. And then also workflow instructions telling how to run those uh, codes uh, with the images, right? So that uh, you should be kind enough to other people. So there are many public data repositories and then uh, there are general repositories such as the Nodo, Fixia, Dryad, Mendeley data, so like this. And then, I, so this is really easy. So uh, I tend to use the Nodo, but what's recommended these days is that there are um, data repositories specifically for image data, such as BioImage Archive and an SPD repository. And then that, um, what's good about this is that control metadata. So that, uh, all this peripheral information about how you capture and then conditions, those are associated with the image data so that you don't lose them. Um, semi, I mean, semi, I mean, I don't know. I mean, not forever, but um, at least spare a little time. It won't be, it will be there. There are even more repositories called edit value image data which allows data to be used by others. So that uh, these are like IDR or NPR or SSMD database. So those are the, so you need a bit more procedure like data publishing, uh, but um, this really conforms to a uh, fair uh, principle. So that uh, if you have capacity, and then uh, I think it's a recommendation that you do this. Okay, so, uh, Another two elements of this uh, recommended is that discuss the scientific adequacy of the workflow and application limits. So that uh, you do this analysis, but don't try to just, you know, um, show this is what I did, but it's better to explain why you did this, uh, why you use this algorithm, not this. And then um, you can also explain the limitation of your workflow, that this is really specifically for this type of analysis or something like this. Um, ideal. So I don't explain detail, but um, you can also put how you run the um, workflow and then how you do the analysis in the YouTube video style, or um, you can also upload Docker uh, image um, that allows completely reproducible environment so that uh, the others can just you know, run it without any stress with the difference in the environment and versions. Okay, so um, this uh, paper, uh, we are now preparing a um, website with more instructions. And then uh, it's also that we can be more interactive with updates and so on. So that uh, 
um, it's accessible in, uh, as a kind of GitHub web page, but search key is at community dev checklist WG12. So uh, the last slide is, uh, so this is uh, from Journal of Cell Science, September issue. And then uh, I will, I try to check um, whether there's an image analysis in each paper, and then also whether those methods are reproducible. And this is, I'm sorry, but it's completely miserable because all papers failed. Uh, I decided that this is not reproducible. So that um, if I have time, I can explain detail. But um, so it's mostly the descriptions are somehow there. Um, there's a good description and a bad descriptions. And then there are some papers that doesn't even have any citation or any. So I don't know which software they used uh, because there's no description. No? I mean, uh, but um, the description some of it there. And then uh, one paper even gave a um, um, link to the upload the sample images, which allows me, which should allow me to uh, evaluate the image analysis, but description was really poor, right? <laughs> uh, somehow, I mean, uh, so I, I started with these headers, code, sample images, key parameters, but you know, it's mostly it was absent. It's only casually described methods there. So uh, we have a long way to go, I think, uh, to uh, let people uh, realize that it's more better science is there if we share our methods in a uh, um, transparent way. So, uh, um, that's about it. And then uh, I'd like to thank um, the members from this uh, 54 people currently me WG12, especially Helena and Christopher, who led this group very passionately and, you know, um, very robust. Yeah, I mean, uh, every month we met for two years. <laughs> that's amazing. And then uh, these days, Mike Nelson is uh, uh, pretty much uh, working on this uh, um, website. And then uh, I didn't know, but he's, he's a graduate student. Uh, I thought he's a really researcher, but uh, he's very passionate in doing this. And then Rora Nitschke has been leading the whole this uh, quiet limi um, um, activities. And then uh, I think it was a very good idea that he started doing this. And then uh, it's often that people ask, what is CRIREP? It's quality assessment and reproducibility for instruments, images in light microscopy. That's very long, but uh, we want to make standards. So that's the intention. And also I'd like to thank Simon, Nuno, Bern. Um, they were actually involved in this, my initial um, consolidation of this idea about this, how to do make a reproducible analysis. And then when we wrote it, there are five people, Perrine, Giovanni, John, Sebastian, and Martin wrote, I was actually read these papers and then there has been like one year of huge discussion about this, right? <laughs> and then after this, we had this quite, which is two years. So uh, it's a long um, sustained work, which now I have presented. Thanks a lot. Great, thank you so much, uh, Kota. Um, and yeah, as I said, uh, please type uh, any questions into the Q and A box. We might not have time to uh, deal, to, to address all of them, but we'll uh, send them over to Kota so he can answer, and then I'll publish them alongside of the recording, as I said before. Okay, so but we'll start with the first one. It says, um, if one is doing a ratiometric analysis and segmentation channel, is it also a bit variable, e.g., DAPI or H two B for nuclei? Is it still okay because we are reporting relative values? I have problem understanding relative versus absolute absolute signal intensity in these terms. Wait, wait. If one is doing ratio metric analysis, okay, so ratio metric analysis, you have a channel one and channel two, and then you try to divide, right? And segmentation channel is also a bit variable. Um, does this mean that there are three channels? I have a problem understanding relative and absolute signal intensity in these terms. Um, so as long as I know, ratio metric analysis is that, um, for, for example, you typically do this when, um, so, okay, so Fred, you do this, but um, 
the typical um, case is that um, you have a difference in intensity just because of volume. So that the, you take uh, um, one channel with a volume marker and then another channel for the target, um, whatever the fluorescent signal that you want, and then you divide this uh, target signal by the volume, which is the intensity difference, and then you get the ratio. Um, but um, no, you started saying that segmentation is there, and then I'm not sure you have a third channel. <laughs> but uh, I cannot uh, answer immediately. You better write a bit more detail. So what about proprietary software like Harmony, which does not disclose the exact algorithm used? Should these be allowed in publications? So that, uh, so it's often said that everything should be open source, but um, sometimes com um, some uh, software do not open the the, um, the algorithm that they're using uh, or codes. In that case, I think um, it's just like a normal scientific instruments. You better calibrate somehow. And then if there's a calibration for measurements, then you can use this even though the, there's a black box there. Otherwise, I think um, um, if you cannot calibrate somehow because of the methodology, um, mm -hmm. then I would doubt using mm -hmm. it, right? Is there another way to do thresholding using intensity measurement that does not include using two channels? Um, So, so, so you want to do everything in a single channel. <laughs> okay. I'm afraid if I stay for two different channels in the same sample. Okay. So I try to answer this afterwards uh, because it's kind of getting complex. I want to have a simulation might be better choice if you are restricted for channels. It seems that something like Stardust does a good job detecting objects in different intensities. Okay. This is again, right? So at, uh, even for AI based segmentation, I think there's somehow there should be calibration. Yeah. Um, 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 because AI based segmentation is mostly um, based on annotation by hands. So that uh, um, that means that um, somehow there should be um, um, scientific adequacy should be uh, assessed using some marker um, that is not um, thresholded. So, uh, there should be not something like this. I mean, uh, okay, so uh, great talk. Regarding the first, oh, Wei Chen, I know him. Um, regarding the first threshold issue, what is your option for the, M and the, the single channel image segmentation? So, uh, uh, well, I mean, uh, machine learning. So, this is a big topic uh, because of uh, um, it's mostly hand annotated. And then uh, hand annotation is basically human. It's not really objective. So that uh, the computer is mimicking subjective human. And then is that really objective? So that's a question, right? I mean, uh, we have to discuss about this longer with uh, analysis specialists. If one wants to segment GFE that protein which form clusters to predict their area, OK? In this case, marking the circumference of this protein cluster is not a choice. Then how should we measure the area of protein clusters using intensity segment? Is not a choice. How about somehow density? You know, so I imagine that mega, right? So mega right is um, trying to somehow quantify cluster of dots, right? And then maybe dot detection algorithm and um, trying to estimate the density of the dots can maybe um, estimate the um, area, right? Isn't it? I don't know. I mean, I have to look at the original image, but um, if we go on, I think uh, we're gonna pass one hour. So I would like to uh, somehow hand this over to Helen. Um, I'm sorry, so I forgot to mention Helen. Um, she's been very passionately um, pushing focal plane and that uh, I would just uh, crap with her, um, praise her efforts.
Thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, both to you, Koto and uh, Helena, for fantastic presentations and very perfect timing as well. And yeah, thank you for all the questions. So as I said, we'll uh, keep a record of them and pass them on and um, look out for the recording because that will come alongside. We'll give you the links um, that we shared here, um, as well as any additional answers to the to the questions as well. Um, and once that post is up again, you can interact with that post by leaving a comment on, on that as well. So yeah, hopefully, if we uh, get the dialogue going on issues like this, then there'll be fewer papers uh, like that in Journal of Cell Science and in other places. I think that that's probably really the important thing here is making sure everyone um, is aware of what they need to do um, and what's acceptable and what's not. And uh, yeah, I think those checklists are really a fantastic um, resource. And I really like the fact that you have uh, graded them in terms of what is absolutely essential, what you would really like to see, and then the bonuses. So then hopefully we can uh, shoot for the moon and end up with the uh, cl clicking on those uh, top recommendations there as well. So yeah, thank you very much. And thanks uh, to you all for attending and yeah, hopefully see you at another one of our webinars soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks for attendance. Thank you, Helen, for organizing. <laughs>